Hello, Eitan. Hello, everybody. We are already open for public because it's exactly half past seven in Holland and half past eight in Tel Aviv. Welcome, everybody. Welcome especially to Eitan Schwartz from Tel Aviv. Um, I'm Hannah Luden from CIDI, and I'm very happy to welcome you all for this uh, online uh, talk uh, tonight. Uh, we, uh, Eitan, if you'll excuse, excuse me for two minutes, I'll say some words in Dutch, and then we'll turn switch again to English. Uh, dames en heren, goedenavond. U heeft me natuurlijk ook in het Engels verstaan, want anders uh, was u hier vandaag, vanavond niet gekomen. En toch wil ik u van harte welkom heten op deze uh, tweede uh, coronatijd uh, bespreking van CD online. Uh, ik hoop dat u het allemaal uh, goed kunt volgen en goed bevalt. We hebben vandaag een hele bijzondere gast. Ethan Schwartz werkt voor de gemeente van Tel Aviv. En hij is daar verantwoordelijk in het dagelijkse leven voor woordvoering, vooral rond uh, start-up en uh, intelligent city, city marketing. Uh, Ethan heeft uh, zelf een uh, indrukwekkende cv met onder andere uh, ervaring als uh, finalist en winnaar van een programma die uh, als thema had hoe kun je Israël uh, presenteren in het buitenland. Misschien kan hij daar ook ons straks over vertellen. Maar vanavond gaan we vooral praten over Tel Aviv in onze tijd, in de tijd van corona. Ethan, I've tried to introduce you uh, sh very shortly and explain to everybody that you uh, normally do lots of different things in Tel Aviv. And of course, today we'll start telling us in, first, in the first place uh, about Tel Aviv in this uh, strange time of corona. And uh, we will start with a short introduction by you. And then afterwards, we will open the floor for questions, which can be uh, written down through Zoom. You can use the, there is a there is a special Q and A uh, uh, button down down your screen. Those who are watching us through Zoom can just stick in their questions, and we'll uh, present them to Aitan later. Of course, we prepared some other questions to here, but I am sure. Actually, I'm afraid Aitan will. Uh, Tell us all about it before we even start the questions, being such an experienced uh, talker. Uh, Eitan, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we will be very interested to hear about uh, Tel Aviv in these times. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Hannah, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I have many good friends in Amsterdam. I don't see Roni, but I know Roni is also supposed to be. Um, when uh, uh, I visited the city um, with another council member um, on behalf of CD, can you hear me, Hannah? Can you just, can you, yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Um, and we've had a wonderful relationship with CD and a wonderful relationship also with the city of Amsterdam and with your previous mayor, who was a wonderful person. And uh, we have a good relationship with the current administration as well. Um, so as you all know, uh, the city of Tel Aviv uh, has an important role in Israel. It's a city uh, that concentrates uh, much of the country's financial strength and much of the country's cultural strength. Um, and like every other part in Israel, we've been stricken by this, um, this horrible epidemic uh, and facing it like the rest of Israel. Um, so the challenges we have are similar to the challenges of the rest of Israel. Um, I think the, um, the threshold, the, the point in which we began to feel uh, this epidemic was around Purim. Uh, the week uh, leading to Purim, there were several restrictions put on the Israeli public, um, and those were quite drastic, it seemed drastic at the time. Um, but it was a rapid, relatively rapid response of the Israeli government. Um, and by this point today, obviously, we're about a month later, but there's no question, I think that people are happy that the Israeli government, relatively speaking, uh, acted quickly and very harshly. Uh, the issue of Purim is very interesting because what we see right now in Israel, the focus has gone onto the very, very high concentration or over-representation of the Haredi community uh, in the number of people sick and of the number of people hospitalized and the number of people that are in social distancing of the Haredi community. 
uh, far more than their representation in population. You can see them represented in these figures. And the belief is that the celebration that took place during Purim, in which many, many people come together in very intimate and crowded uh, settings, uh, played a role in the outburst of the sickness that we now see in this, um, in this community. Today, Tel Aviv is ranked number three in the number, in the absolute number of uh, sick people. We are about around 400 people and we had uh, two people die. Um, but it must be said that this number represents more or less our representation in Israeli society. So there are about 5% of the people that are sick, they come from Tel Aviv and Tel Aviv population is about 5% of the Israeli population. So the numbers more or less fit our size in Israeli population. Uh, we face the same challenges. We face the same threats. Uh, it must be said that the Tel Aviv Yafo municipality, despite the fact that it is considered a strong a municipality, it has many, many challenges. Our number one concern today, our number one concern is feeding people that we are concerned with uh, their ability to feed themselves. To begin with, uh, um, uh, 40 uh, out of a out of a city of 450,000 people, we have 25,000 households which are regularly on our welfare system, uh, receive support from our welfare system. Uh, when you visit Tel Aviv, you usually visit places like the beach and the White City and the more affluent parts of town. But there are other sections of the city, like in any other city, where you have uh, underprivileged societies and people. And in any event, 25,000 households are on our welfare system. Since this uh, began, um, two new populations became a very, very high concern. First of all, obviously anyone who's over 65 years old who is considered a, considered a senior citizen and must be taken care of, people that are not allowed to leave their homes. So we are talking about 70,000 people. This is a very, very high number. Uh, it's more than 10% of the population. And in addition to that, every day we have more and more families uh, touching the poverty line. So while we have our lists of who um, should receive food, every day our municipal hotline gets calls from people we do not know of in our welfare system, which are asking for food. Um, another very interesting community, and this uh, should be said, um, has to do with the illegal immigrant community. Um, you might know that in Tel Aviv, one out of every 10 residents is an illegal. So we're talking about people coming from Africa, uh, some Asian countries, sometimes South American countries who came to Israel either seeking asylum or seeking labor. They tend to congregate in one main neighborhood and near the old bus station uh, in Tel Aviv. We're talking about 40, 50,000 people. And these people, not only are they among the poorest echelons of Israeli society, uh, in fact, they are not Israeli, and for that, uh, they are not uh, entitled to any type of social benefit for social security or for a social network. So our fear is that, I'm sorry, we are, our fear is that by uh, next week, we will see um, many of these people not being able to pay their rent. Most of them do not have any savings. Um, and uh, they will become another burden on our uh, system. Unlike other poor sections of Israeli society, they are not entitled to assistance from the state. And this is a very, very, very big concern uh, of the mayor of Tel Aviv. Um, so this is where we are at this point. Um, everybody now in Israel is looking uh, towards uh, Wednesday, towards Pesach, Passover. The big fear of the Israeli government and the Israeli police is that people will not follow the rules uh, of staying at home and will do what is very, very natural for us Jewish families and which is congregate in large familial uh, uh, dinners. Um, the instructions to everybody in Israel for the past few weeks is do not get close to your grandparents. And of course, that is something that is very, very hard to do, definitely on Passover. Um, and the Israeli government will put a lot of effort on enforcing that. They will block the roads, they will check people trying to drive from city to city, they will punish people trying to drive from city to city, and so on and so forth. Um, 
this is the main concern and feeding, bringing food to people for the next few days of Passover and making sure they will go through the holiday uh, with enough food. So in summary, that is what we are most concerned of right now. Um, and like the rest of the country, uh, we are under the national government's uh, control, which is we follow the rules of our Ministry of Health. And it must be said also that the Israeli military, which is a very, very effective uh, organization, has entered also the cities and is assisting the police uh, with the distribution of food and with the enforcement of law. Please. Um, Eitan, maybe you can elaborate about the way the, where the municipality uh, authorities have uh, uh, attacked this uh, challenge. Have you have, do you have a special forces for it? Do you have a special uh, uh, rule, local rules and things like that? Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, and wh which topic are you referring to specifically? How the city of Tel Aviv has organized itself to cope at this point. We talked about the problems. How does the municipality work on it? So right now, the, um, the, two the two tasks, which is distributing food and reaching all the elderly, um, is being, uh, that's, I would say that's the main manpower uh, um, initiative that has been formed. So the, the regular teams that operate in, in, in the fields like of cleaning the city and sanitation and that type of stuff, they, these guys are working like usual. Uh, the efforts right now on those two segments, on the elderly and the needy, uh, have brought together a lot of employees, and we are also relying on hundreds and hundreds of volunteers um, for both tasks. So, for instance, tomorrow um, we will be distributing um, 25,000 meals to 5,000 people. Uh, this will be done near our stadium, near our basketball stadium in Tel Aviv, where Maccabi Tel Aviv plays, if you know it. Um, Hundreds of people, about volunteers, will arrive with their uh, vehicles. They will be given addresses uh, and food, and they will bring this food and knock on doors and bring it to people that we are know uh, are, are, are entitled to this and are also waiting for this food. Um, the same will be done, by the way, uh, in, the, in Jaffa, which you all know. In Jaffa, we also have a mixed population of Jews and Arabs. Um, also, some of the population there comes from the lower parts of of um, the economic uh, sector and uh, a lot of these people also rely on welfare. That is one effort where we have the city, um, the army and volunteers working together. And the other task is mainly, mainly volunteers, which is calling old people or people at over 70, not necessarily old, uh, calling them on behalf of the municipality, asking them if they are okay, if they need any help. What has become clear now already at this point is that this system, for it to be sustainable, we have to go from a uh, centralized organization to a much more flat one. So what we are starting next week, and if this works, we will spread it to other neighborhoods because essentially we expect this to go on for months, is the system we are devising is to have uh, almost like a pyramid of command where at the lower part of this pyramid, you have a representative or a commander or a person, a go-to person in each building. So in each building, if you have one or two or three old people, there's one person who's in charge of knocking on their door every day, making sure they're okay. If they need anything, they will take care of that. Um, it must be said that under our current regulations, we are allowed to go out for two reasons, which is to buy food and medication or to work if we are still working. So it is okay to go out and buy food. It can be only within 100 meters. And therefore, we have people that can go buy and shop for the old people and bring them food and bring them medication. Uh, but it is clear that the city in the long run will not be able to take care of all these needs, which will only continue to grow. But we need to have one person in every building. And that person in every building will report to one person who's in charge of the street. And the person in charge of the street will report to the person who's in charge of the neighborhood and so on and so forth. So if we really need to help somebody, we will know exactly who we need to help, but everybody else we assume will be taken care of. This is not 
something that we are used to thinking about because it's our assumption in our system that the government, in this case, the local government has to be in charge. But there is no way we will be able to be in charge in the long run for months and months to come. And we have to come up with different ways of solidarity, of uh, what we say in Hebrew, avut hadadit, where we give more authority and more responsibility knowingly to the locals and we tell them, we need you, we need you to be responsible. You are part of this because this is something new and we've never done this before. And what is your experience? How is the response of the people? I think people want to be given, people want to be given tasks. People want to feel that they're part of something. People want to know that what they're doing is effective. Um, we've seen a lot, a lot of, of, uh, of grassroots efforts and this always happens in Israel at times of war, at times of crisis. The difference here is, you know, a war, you can have a building fall down and, and it's a single event. In our case, the epidemic can spread from, from, from building to building. So we do not know how to address this challenge. It's, it's, it's a completely new way of looking at things. Um, and Israel has been preparing for various scenarios of, of, of uh, preparedness and resilience is something that specifically in Tel Aviv is a very, very, very high issue. But the issue of epidemic has always been in the back mind. We've always been thinking about wars and scenarios of violence, not of this. So, um, so, so it's, a different, it's a different situation. The shops are full. Uh, there's not a shortage of food. Uh, that's not the issue. It's a, it's a completely different issue. And uh, right now, the responses have been very, very uh, good. People are used to helping each other. And I think they're willing to hear the government say, we need you now as part of our effort. Could you give us a short description on how Tel Aviv looks like now? Uh, Dizengoff Street, the, the beach, uh, the Yarkon bar very, Park. Yeah, very, very empty and very sad. Unfortunately, um, it's, uh, it's very sad to see the streets. I won't say it's, it doesn't look like what it looks like in Italy. It's not a curfew. People are allowed out in the sense that you see people with their dogs. And in Tel Aviv, we have many, many dogs. So people are allowed to walk out with their dogs. You're allowed to do a 100 meter walk, so people do that. And people, you know, they extend beyond the 100 meters uh, that they're allowed to. And, and, and it's, it's still, you know, the, the police and the government, they're still, they're still easing uh, uh, on the measures of, uh, of enforcement. They're not, they're not insisting on enforcing uh, because it's clear that it's, it's very hard for people to be at home. Um, but it's very sad. The places you all know and love are empty. The beach, of course, is empty and nobody's allowed on the beach. And that is definitely enforced. Um, one of the things that has been happening here and have been happening all over the world is that uh, the rejuvenation of nature and also of urban nature is very, very interesting. You hear birds, um, uh, you hear the noise. It's very interesting because one of the things, one of the sectors that have not been hurt at all is the construction sector. And actually the government was very smart in allowing that to continue. So construction takes on, to goes on and, and infrastructure goes on. And it's actually much quicker now because without anybody on the road, things are done much, much, much quicker. Um, so we have a lot of complaints at the hotline at City Hall, people complaining about the noise. And the thing is, the noise isn't louder than it used to be. It's just that now they can hear it. They weren't, they weren't, they didn't notice it before because everything was noisy. Now everything is quiet except for the construction sites. So people living by construction sites are always calling City Hall and saying, hey, there's a lot of noise near, near our apartment. Um, so definitely it's, it's a sad scene to see, um, but we see some people on the streets and the one, of, the one sector which is working fantastically besides the shops and uh, the pharmacies are the restaurants. The restaurants are allowed to deliver. You can no longer come to a restaurant and pick up, and obviously you can't sit in a restaurant, but the kitchens are allowed to work and they're allowed to deliver. So we have several companies that do it, like Vault, which you have in Europe. Uh, Vault Israel, even before the crisis, was considered the most successful of all their franchises. And you see scooters with people delivering food all the time. All the time. You see them. It, it's really, really a, a phenomenal scene because people, people in the Tel Aviv like to order in. So this is happening a lot. Uh, and otherwise, the streets are clean and quiet. Could you elaborate a lot, a bit more about the economic situation, about the, how the economy is functioning or not functioning at the moment, and what are the concerns there? The, there are huge concerns in the field of the economy. Uh, the sentiment in Israel right now is that uh, in comparison to what European governments have done, have done and 
what the American government has declared, uh, the measures taken towards um, the business sector in Israel uh, have been very, 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 very small uh, and not fast enough. Uh, there's a big disappointment. It must be said that right now, we believe that about a million Israelis, 25% uh, of the population, of the working population, is in essence uh, unemployed. Um, and we believe that that figure will go up very, very quickly. Um, I think the main, uh, two main concerns should be said. One is obviously people that are unemployed, uh, people that have been put on leave, but will become officially unemployed very quickly. And the second issue has to do with uh, independence, what we call the independence, people that have their own business or people that are not uh, part of a large organization. In th that was always the, the weak point in, um, in our social network. While we do have a social a welfare system in Israel, uh, which used to be better, but is still functional, um, independence, people that have their own business, when they go out of business, they receive nothing. Um, no unemployment, no compensation. And this is a very, 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 very large sector of people, uh, people that pay taxes, people that were successful and uh, literally do not know where their next uh, meal might come from. Not necessarily right now, but within a month, we'll start seeing people uh, in very, very, very big distress. Um, as you know, uh, in our system, we, we like to own our own house. Uh, to do that, we take very, very, very high mortgages, or we pay very, very high rent. And it's very clear that ve very soon, uh, we will see a lot of people being thrown out of their apartments, because unlike in the European system, the public housing sector in Israel is, com is, is, is almost non-existent. We, do, we hardly have social housing, and we hardly have public housing. But would, would you expect these things to change because, for example, I can imagine that all those bed and breakfast uh, apartments all over Tel Aviv are empty at the moment, right? The Airbnb. Could maybe, is, excuse yeah. me. Could you maybe elaborate more about the whole uh, the whole hospitality business in Tel Aviv at the moment? So the the, the tourism sector in Israel stopped completely, absolutely completely. Um, in the case of Tel Aviv. Um, we, we are paying the same price as everybody else. It will take us longer to recover, recover relatively speaking, because our tourism sector uh, relies 75% on foreign tourists and only 25% domestic tourists, unlike other places in Israel. And the assumption is all over the tourism world sector in the world after this crisis is domestic tourism. So for instance, in China now, I know that people are looking towards the Chinese vacations of October for domestic Chinese travel. It will take time for people from outside China to go back. The same goes for Israel. And since our tourism sector is so heavily based on uh, incoming tourism in Tel Aviv, it will take us a long time to recover. There are several hotels that have been converted to uh, recovery zones run by the military for people that were sick, but don't need to be hospitalized. They just need to recover. Um, for instance, the Dan Panorama, which many of you probably know, near the David Intercontinental, that is now being run by the Israeli military. And actually, it's a pretty good deal for the people that are there. There's several hundred people that are being recovered there, and they live in nice hotel rooms, and, um, and they have uh, recreational areas, but they're not allowed to leave the hotel. Um, but obviously, all the Airbnb industry uh, has completely collapsed, with the exception of one type of resident, which is we know of people that when they have to be in social isolation, um, instead of staying in their own house, if they have families, they go to an Airbnb apartment if they have the money to do that. So we know of that happening. But otherwise, we're talking about a city where we believe that we have the highest rate of Airbnb in the world in comparison to hotel rooms. So we have uh, more than 10,000 regular apartments in this city that serve for some hospitality of some sort. Uh, that's a that's a very very high number of units. These uh, these people and mainly when they're businesses that own several units uh, have obviously collapsed, and this business is completely changing. And we have um, and we have all the hotels to look for. Uh, but it must be said, um, nonetheless, that um, our hotel sector, in terms of construction, is still going on, and entrepreneurs 
are still filing for paperwork at City Hall to begin projects. So there's a lot of confidence in the Israeli economy and specifically in the economy in Tel Aviv. Uh, people know that this crisis will be over and we see people at, at times of crisis uh, also seeking opportunities. So that means you don't expect that the rent in Tel Aviv will go down because of that crisis. I think the, um, the assumption is that, that the, 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 the market in Israel in general will suffer a huge, 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 huge uh, setback. Uh, think about all the people in this city that rent apartments, uh, that enjoyed a double income, and now maybe don't enjoy any income at all, and they have to pay high rents. How many of these people will move out of Tel Aviv or to smaller apartments or back to their parents' house? Probably quite a lot. So it's very hard to anticipate, but it's clear um, that the recovery of the economy will take much, much, much longer than it took, it for, than it took for, for its collapse. What are the industries which do flourish now, which do business? You talked about uh, home delivery from restaurants. What about the high-tech industry? What about uh, um, startups? How is this doing? So the small startups that have uh, five employees or less are allowed to work. The larger working places are not allowed to continue in the same way. A lot of them have gone to working from home. So insofar as they have clients or they have products to develop or they have enough capital to, 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 to burn, companies are still working. So some sectors are still working. Obviously, the, the, uh, the, the supermarkets and the kiosks are all working very, very well, as are the pharmacies. Um, people that deal with content are making money. Uh, but entire industries, like our cultural scene, is completely uh, on hold. We have in this city, and it's our pride, we're the center of culture for Israel, thousands and thousands of people that rely heavily on, uh, on their performances. So the city is coming up with a, a, uh, an, er, an emergency fund for culture in which we will essentially subsidize activities by various artists just to keep, as we say in Hebrew, their head above the water. Um, this is one of the funds we are now in, in the process of launching, and I believe it will be launched by next week. All the efforts I discussed are being done by the Tel Aviv Foundation, which is essentially the, the fundraising branch of City Hall. The mayor is the chair of this foundation, and this is his way to raise money for various causes outside of the regular budget. Uh, things that, when you talk about, for instance, about uh, foreigners, illegal migrants, and that type of stuff, um, definitely you have all these causes where you need to raise money uh, from other sources. So it's very important. So this foundation uh, with another donor is launching a fund for artists in which we will distribute money in exchange for activities, uh, but it's really a way to keep the artists uh, with their heads above the water. And what, uh, what about the, the whole medical sector? How does this operate at the moment in Tel Aviv? The metal soul sector is obviously uh, very, very exhaustive. Um, over the past few years, there's been a lot of reports, uh, and I'm not saying anything that was not uh, publicly uh, made uh, clear. Our medical sector was being under budgeted for many years. This is something that has been of concern. And now we feel that the system, we can feel um, that it's obviously much weaker than it should have been or it could have been. Uh, and this is something that I am sure the Israeli public will have to deal with after this crisis is over. Uh, but the doctors and the nurses, they're all doing a fantastic job and uh, they're enjoying the support of the public. In City Hall, even though all the kindergartens were shut down and the schools were shut down, we managed to get special permission from the Ministry of Health to open a few kindergartens next to the main hospital, Ichilov, and also in other places near smaller hospitals so that people that have kids up to the age of eight and they work in these hospitals, specifically in the corona uh, uh, issue, they bring their kids in the morning and therefore they can uh, at least go to work knowing that somebody's taking care of their kids. So this is a very nice act in the city of Tel Aviv. Yapo. It's also, it's also play, taking place in Jerusalem and in other places where they have large medical facilities. Would you, would you say that Tel Aviv has a different, uh, 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 different challenges than other places in Israel? Or is it more or less similar in most places? Uh, and it's, how is the cooperation? It's more or less similar. So if you look at the, let's separate the mainstream 
um, Hebrew speaking population in Israel, which more or less has been known and notified about this crisis very, very, very clearly for the past month. People know the instructions, and if they don't follow them, it's because they decide not to follow them. But there's nobody in Israel that speaks Hebrew that doesn't know how dramatic this is. Among other things, because our prime minister is on television almost every night, live, talking and warning. So, and he's a very, very effective speaker, obviously, and people know what's going on. Then we go, when we go to the more segmented parts of Israeli society, for instance, the ultra-Orthodox, as I discussed before. So in Tel Aviv, we have ultra-Orthodox communities. They are more informed and they're more integrated. Um, then on the other side of the Arkon River, for instance, in Bnei Brak, which is suffering very, very severely uh, in terms of the numbers. Um, two other populations which should be looked at, the Israeli Arabs, which being a more poor society, you would expect high numbers of, of sick, but actually they're quite low. And the third population, which, is, uh, which exists in our city, uh, which is very poor and very underprivileged, as I said, these are the illegals, the foreigners. And this is a very, while they exist in, 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 as communities in other cities, um, what we have now in, in the city of Tel Aviv is, uh, is, is the center of this community. And we're talking about tens of thousands. And they're really, this is a big, big concern for City Hall because it's a challenge that is, we feel is, uh, is not unique to us, but the, but the clearest for us. And uh, these are people that don't have social networks, they don't have families, they don't have anywhere to go. If they're kicked out of the apartment, they literally have nowhere else to live. Uh, some of them don't speak the language. Um, they don't enjoy any benefits. So we've been raising a lot of money, mainly abroad for this community, because we feel that this is a community we have, there's a lot of Jewish people around the world that feel that they have a moral obligation. Uh, and when we talk about uh, Passover and remembering Ki Geraita Beretz Mitzrayim, we sometimes feel that this message comes across more clearly abroad than it does, unfortunately, among the Israeli public. Your contact relation and lessons you can learn from other countries? All the time, and we, ex we exchange ideas with other countries. Right now in City Hall, tomorrow we are ending a three-day uh, hackathon where we launched some challenges and we asked people to help us think about solutions. Um, we have discussions with other cities. There are several international platforms, international coalitions of cities where they have webinars where people exchange ideas. And the city of Tel Aviv will publish, I hope next week in English, our best practices um, to other cities to spread on these platforms because people are exchanging ideas all the time. We see things happening in other cities. Um, um, and, and there's obviously solutions uh, that we can learn from each other. Where can we see those, uh, those lessons learned? Is there somewhere we can read about this more? When it's out, I'll send it to you. It will be on our website, on our municipal website, absolutely. I want to, uh, to remind our public that if anybody wants to pose a question, you can use the Q&A button on the button of, on the bottom of, the, of your screen, of your Zoom screen, if you want to, to hand in any questions. We asked already one question that was concerning econ economics and how, uh, and if there is a task force regarding the post-corona time. This is one question, but I think you elaborated on that already, right, uh, Eitan? Uh, we have some questions about the startups in Tel Aviv, for example, about the scooter challenge, uh, the scooter rent um, uh, uh, startup, which is in Tel Aviv. I'm not sure what, uh, what it is, but uh, let me see. I wrote it down. Um, oh, where was it? Um, Maybe I'll ask, I'll start with another question and find out exactly what the, that question was about. But there are some questions about new immigrants coming to Israel on Aliyah. Is this still on? And is this something Tel Aviv is concerned about? I think we lost Eitan. Eitan? I... Let me see. Um, uh, I think we have lost the connection with Eitan, so I will uh, uh, try to uh, at least 
rephrase the questions we got. We got one question about the economics, which I already, which already was discussed, and actually many more questions about that. We asked, we got some questions about the startups. Um, as far as I understand, uh, there is not much new going on, and there is a new question about medication in Israel. And oh, Eitan, are you are you with us again? But you're not. You're. We can't hear you. You, ha you have to release your microphone, Eitan. Eitan, your microphone is locked, so we can't hear you. Er is iets met de microfoon van Eitan, waardoor hij niet uh, te horen is. Ik kan zien dat zijn microfoon uit is. Maar kennelijk krijgt hij hem niet aan. Ik zal even de regie vragen of zij er iets aan kunnen doen. Ik krijg van de regie te horen dat ze proberen het probleem op te lossen. Uh, Ethan, can you hear me? Please nod if you can hear me. Probably not. Um, ik zal even proberen samen te vatten uh, wat Ethan heeft. Oh, Ethan is with us again. Ethan? Are you with us? Yes. yes. Yeah. Ethan, one of the questions which was posed was about medication and medical equipment. Is there enough? of it in Israel in general and in Tel Aviv in particular? Um, I'll answer that. I just, I apologize I, for, a, for the disconnection and also I have to, within 10 minutes, I have another webinar. I didn't realize I was talking so much. Um, I, I, I won't separate Tel Aviv from the rest of Israel because I don't think um, there's a, t a, a problem of distribution, but obviously, yes, there is a shortage of medical equipment. There's a shortage of, um, of ventilation systems. Uh, there's a there's a fear that if we have too many people Excuse ill, me. we will not have Excuse enough to me. go around. Ventilation systems is beademing apparatus. Go ahead. That yes. is a big problem we have in the country. There's not enough, um, and um, that I think that's the main issue. And as I said, in our medical system, we have a very low rate of beds per population in comparison to other OECD countries. And now we 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 fear that the that the um, that the system will be uh, clogged up with people. Yes. Uh, there was another question which was asked, and it was about people who want to make Aliyah, who to immigrate to Israel. Um, we read that it's still going on. Uh, can you elaborate on that? And would you say that there are some professions which are more welcome or more needed than others? Or specially uh, needed, let's put it this way. <laughs> I, I haven't, I've seen yesterday in the newspaper about, I read about a family that just moved here from, uh, from the United States. So Aliyah still goes on and there are flights. Um, in terms of the job market, this is the worst time to come. Even if you are a doctor, for instance, I don't, unless you have an Israeli license, you can't work in our system, no matter how established you are. And to pass the, I'm sure there is nothing going on in terms of uh, passing exams and that type of stuff. So you will, you will obviously find yourself jobless here uh, until things get back to normal. So in terms of if you want to work here, it's the worst time to come. If you have other plans, yes, Aliyah goes on and it's obviously uh, as safe as any other country right now in the world. What do you think people here in the Netherlands could do to support Israel, Tel Aviv, one way or another? Is there anything people could do? I think what you're doing is fantastic, and I uh, and I applaud you always for all your efforts. Um, the I, I know you give to many organizations in Israel and keep on doing so. Mada MDA uh, is doing a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic job. They are on the forefront of the efforts. Um, the other day, we lit City Hall with a red uh, Magen David Star of David to honor them all the medical teams, all the hospitals. So if you give charity to Israel, if you give money to Israel for medical causes, whatever you do is very, very needed. And if you wanna give specifically to the uh, causes I talked about, the Tel Aviv Foundation, you can go on their website. Uh, it's our best tool of fundraising because it's, uh, it, these are causes that the mayor has 
designated as important and crucial for the city of Tel Aviv. And it's a partner of the city. So this is funds that go directly into city related projects that we urgently need. What do we see? When can, you, can we welcome you here in Amsterdam or in The Hague? Um, I'm looking forward to, and um, obviously, um, you know, as I have two small girls and a small boy, and they all know about Amsterdam, they want to come to Amsterdam, and also they all know of Anne Frank, and uh, they now feel what it is like to be Anne Frank. They haven't left the house in three weeks, and they live in a 90-meter apartment, and I explained to them that Anne Frank spent a bit longer in a room that was a bit smaller, uh, and she didn't have... Well, I think, I think we lost Aiton again. And as he has to uh, finish in a few minutes, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, let him know that we are uh, thankful for his time with us. And we've learned a bit about Israel and we hope we can uh, cope here and they can cope in Tel Aviv. Aiton, I know you're not hearing us, but I, I also know you have to leave. So I want to thank you very much for your time and for the information you shared with us. I wish Tel Aviv and Israel a lot of success. And uh, the people here have a very good Pesach on Wednesday Abend. Nice Passion, and Easter a few, a few days later on Friday, Saturday, and so forth. Uh, and we'll see you again. Follow our website for more webinars. On the 19th of April, we have uh, a meeting with Yossi Klein and Levy scheduled. And there are two, two meetings planned afterwards. You can find all the information on our website. I want you all, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for being with us. I hope we, you, we, we handled most of the questions you posed. I saw there was one question which came too late and this was concerned the medical uh, uh, aperture in Israel. There is at the moment enough, but this, the problems are very similar to the ones here in the Netherlands. When too many people will be sick, there will be a shortage. And this is of course the fear we all have. And that's why everybody is in quarantine at the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for coming and till next time. And again, a very good Pesach and a very good time in your homes. What we are seeing now is a uh, is an Israeli group singing about Corona. And that's the words you can read down there. It's quite a nice song. I can't hear it, but you might be able to.